Good afternoon. I'm Bill Walker. I'm the Vice President for Strategic Communications and External Relations here at Rensselaer. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the program. And uh, I've been reminded that all of us should uh, silence our cell phones at this point, if you would uh, join me in that. Uh, the relationship between Rensselaer and the World Economic Forum began five years ago. Uh, at that point, the WEF reached out to President Jackson to attend the annual meeting as a subject area uh, expert, and since then, she's been invited back every year to offer commentary in various areas and to moderate discussions on various topics. That relationship eventually led to a, uh, an invitation to the faculty, a faculty group to present at what they call Summer Davos, uh, which takes place every September in China. This year, Rensselaer was asked to be one of only 11 universities from around the world to present an ideas lab at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. The title the WEF leadership uh, asked, uh, re requested was from concept to commerce. The request was that the team present the story of the decade-long transformation of Rensselaer under the Rensselaer plan into a fully realized national research university that has enabled path-breaking research in many different areas. Specifically, they asked President Jackson to describe the transformation of Rensselaer and how the lessons we learned in our plan might apply to creating change more broadly at the national and international levels. We suggested three specific areas as examples of the important research the Rensselaer plan has enabled, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and network science. The program was presented exactly two months ago today, January 27th, in Switzerland. We decided, in order to make it available to the Rensselaer community and to post it on our website, to record it today in this reprise of the program. A word about the format. It's called a Pecha Kucha presentation, and it's very tightly prescribed. The entire presentation is 20 minutes long. Each speaker presents material with 15 visuals, completing each section within five minutes. In Davos, the program was followed by, by concurrent small group discu discussions led by each of the speakers. Today, we'll have a question answer session with all of the presenters. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us as we share exciting work at the nexus of nanotechnology, biotechnology, and complex networks, work that goes from concept to commerce. Now, with me this afternoon are Professor Richard W. Siegel, director of the Rensselaer Nanotechnology Center, and the Robert W. Hunt Professor of Materials Science and Engineering. Professor Jonathan Dordick, the Howard P. Iserman Professor of Biochemical Engineering and Director of the Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, and Professor Bolick Szymanski, the Claire and Roland Schmidt Distinguished Professor of Computer Science and Director of the Social Cognitive Networks Academic Research Center. In a changing world, transformation is essential. For any organization, planning and execution are key. The transformative experience of Rensselaer has enabled the path-breaking research of the Rensselaer professors here with me today. Transformation is not a de novo exercise. It builds on talented people with the right resources and platforms who define the imperatives of the time and work across disciplines to address them. Rensselaer has a history of such achievement since 1824. The Brooklyn Bridge, the first cathode ray tube for television, the first microprocessor, the internet protocol for email. Transformation occurs only if there are unique opportunities and leadership that advocates their pursuit. The trustees of Rensselaer saw a university capable of adapting its historic strength to the demands of the 21st century, emerging as a world-class technological research university. The backbone of Rensselaer's transformation is the Rensselaer Plan, providing strategic guidance across the key endeavors of the university, 
including new research directions, the student experience, and effective administration. The plan is evergreen. Our commitment to research is anchored in five signature areas, biotechnology and the life sciences, nanotechnology and advanced materials, computation and IT, including network science, media arts science and technology, energy and the environment. The execution of the plan crosses four dimensions, people, programs, platforms, and partnerships. Three key platforms anchor our transformation. The Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies, the CCNI, our supercomputer center, and the Curtis R. Prem Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center, IMPAC, which sits at the nexus of media arts, science, and technology. That's where we're sitting today. We seed funded the Rensselaer Nanotechnology Center, which led to our US National Science Foundation funded Nanoscale Science and Engineering Center. Our distinctive and novel approach is the constellation concept, which brings together critical masses of new faculty and their students in important research areas, such as biocatalysis and metabolic engineering. We have established 30 research centers including nanotechnology, nanobiotechnology, network science and engineering, web science, which combine the knowledge, skills, and resources of academia, industry, and government, all under the aegis of Rensselaer. We have one of the earliest university-based technology parks. We have an innovative business incubation program, the Emerging Ventures Ecosystem. A resultant example of concept to commerce is Ecovative Design, a company started by two Rensselaer students dedicated to sustainable packaging. Through our innovation ecosystem, our faculty, working at the forefront of research and tackling the challenges of our time, bring transformational ideas into the larger society and prepare our students for the roles they will play as Rensselaer changes the world. We extend our impact through engagement in public policy, including the US President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, PCAST. In 2011, PCAST delivered a report to the President on ensuring American leadership in advanced manufacturing, focused on bringing breakthrough technologies to market. Also, the International Security Advisory Board of the US Department of State, which provides Secretary Hillary Clinton with independent advice on scientific, technological, and policy aspects of international security and public diplomacy. Bio and nanotechnologies, new media, networks, and IT are critical to meet our most pressing global challenges, to kill antibiotic resistant bacteria on contact, to nanostructure special materials and integrate them into living systems and the converse, to understand cultural nuance, influence, and even constituency group formation in social cognitive networks. This ideas lab features experts in each of three disciplines, their work is impactful, and I look forward to the results of our discussions and interactions here today. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. The economic history of the world is writ in the history of materials, stone, bronze, iron, steel in the 19th century, plastics and silicon in the 20th, and now in the 21st we have nanomaterials. The historic flow of materials has been underwritten heretofore by the chemical and physical sciences. However, since the advent of molecular biology 
in the last century, biology is contributing to this flow in unprecedented ways. We now understand the similarities between the parallel worlds of technology and nature, both engaged in building hierarchical material systems with hybrid constituents. But technology has still much to learn from nature, especially at the nanoscale. If we wish to create a system with the intricate sophistication that nature does, we need to become far more adept in incorporating the attributes of nanoscale science and technology. What's so special about the nanoscale? By analogy, we can walk on stones, but when they are pulverized into dry sand, we cannot easily do so. Until water is added to make a firm composite, so it is with nanomaterials with their much larger surface and interface areas that their pro properties can be dramatically changed, and they are also size dependent. But is nanotechnology something only for the future? Look at a springtime street scene in today's Stuttgart. What do you see? Look very carefully. With technologically cognizant eyes, you would see many examples of nanotechnology already in use, making our lives better and improving the human condition. Sunscreens, light-emitting diode displays, magnetic recording devices, improved medical prostheses, and many, many more. In the past decade, we have created an exciting toolbox for making unprecedented hierarchical materials based on nanoscale building blocks, such as nanoparticles, nanotubes, nanolayers, synthetic and natural polymers, proteins, and hybrid conjugates of these. And the ability of this toolbox will enable us to create material solutions to problems facing society, along with new economic opportunities in healthcare, manufacturing efficiency, deep space exploration and colonization, and many more areas. But how will the complexities of the sciences be transmitted effectively to the world's future workforce, leaders, and decision makers? We need to greatly expand our concepts of education to incorporate a much broader scope of teaching and learning. Our approach is to combine entertainment and education what I call self-education, to bring audiences into the technical world that they cannot easily see, but which informs and excites them about the wondrous world of atoms and molecules in which we reside. Here, a copper penny with its regular array of atoms is quite different from the atom arrangement in this flexible polymer chain, but on a carbon back, built on a carbon backbone that can take many configurations as the building blocks of plastics. Its structure is similar to biological polymers in atom organization, but simpler than biopolymers such as DNA, seen here in the inner structure and workings of a human cell. Materials made up of atoms and molecules constitute all of us and everything around us. The organization of atoms change, properties change, and materials make up our world. Entertaining adventure movies such as these, however, do not reach many young people. They are on the internet, and we need to reach them there with exciting, fun, and informative content on interactive websites such as this Hall of Molecules in Nanospace, in which short educational movies, fun games, and entertaining areas of the park inform visitors regarding sizes of the universe, different materials, the water cycle, and the world of molecular biology. Visit molecularium.com to be entertained and educated stealthily. OK, good afternoon. So nature is a remarkable biotechnologist, from proteins that live or that are present within our cells that catalyze reactions to plants that give rise to natural products like the anti-cancer compound Taxol, to many things that we just don't yet know. 
Nature is extraordinarily diverse, and we're only beginning now to understand how to exploit her and her tremendous diversity and exquisite uh, molecular capabilities. If one looks at even our own cells, nature and nano do come together. Nature uh, cellular systems have nano machines that could give rise to the ability to make proteins fold correctly. If they don't, they give rise to diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. On the left, you see examples of a, pro of a system called a chaperone that a protein threads through a hole, like a thread through needle, uh, and give rise to proteins that are highly functional. But if proteins don't fold right, there are other systems in the cell acting like a garbage disposal that breaks down those proteins and eliminates them so that they don't cause any problems. Simpler systems in nature can actually be exploited very easily. For example, the same chemicals that give rise to the itchy rash that you get from poison ivy also give rise to lacquer that you have, particularly in Asian furniture and things like that. But if we control things in a different way, we can actually make nanotubular structure that can be used to deliver drugs very safely and effectively in the human body. When you really start looking at how nature and nano come together, you're struck with a question that we have always wanted to ask and we have yet to get an answer to which is what's the limit to where life can exist? If you take a simple looking uh, a diagram of a pressure temperature uh, profile of life, what we're looking at here are the ecosystems on this planet that we know life exists. We don't know where, if life exists where the question marks are, although the biomolecules might survive. And we're adding to this a complexity of what happens when we bring together biological systems with non-biological systems like nanomaterials. If one looks at what this really means, we're effectively looking at a new space, a new phase space, that's bounded by biomolecules, bio by nanomaterials, and by polymers like we see around us all the time. And when we look into that middle, we're asking questions in areas we just don't understand much of, and yet if we can begin to exploit that hierarchy and that hybrid capability of bringing them together, we can exploit them in unique ways to solve critical problems in society today. Now one of those problems has to do with the emergence of superbugs, bacteria that are resistant to most antibiotics that are problems in hospitals and food and so forth. What you see here are three different examples, MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, that are, of course a significant problem in hospital-acquired infections, bacillus, as well as listeria that's present in our foods and is a tremendous source of significant uh, health problems. What we're looking at is developing approaches that could be used to kill these bacteria on contact. An example is a paint which would incorporate enzymes that are found in nature that destroy bacteria that they target on nanomaterials embedded within a paint that you can buy from Walmart, for example. And in doing so, you end up with an extraordinarily active system where bacteria can be killed simply by falling on top of that. Now, this isn't just done here on Earth. In fact, we brought this up to the space shuttle in perhaps, uh, perhaps the last experiment ever run, unfortunately, in the shuttle because it had to be run near the end. And so we can actually kill MRSA not only here on the ground but also up in space. When you're looking at this, you're effectively looking at a nanomaterial, a fiber system, that forms the basis of the paint. The enzymes are incorporated on that, and when bacteria hit that surface, they're killed. And you can see with patient-derived MRSA strains obtained from a hospital, you're getting significant killing that occurs simply by virtue of the, of the cells falling onto the surface and sitting there and being killed. In another area, I mentioned the food industry. One of the biggest problems that exist is food poisoning that affects millions of people, maybe 50 million people a year. We've all probably had that problem. Last year, there was a recall of cantaloupe because of the deadly listeria bacteria. We're developing packaging material that can be used from the farm eventually to our plates so that by the time the food gets to you, it's going to be free of the bacteria, such as listeria, shown here essentially blowing up due to the action of these enzyme systems. In addition to bacteria, spores have been a major problem. You can see both man-made environments as well as natural environments harbor a variety of dormant organisms. These are intriguing because they come back to life very quickly, as I'll talk about in a moment, but you can see the different diseases that occur, 
simply based on spore-forming organisms. Some of these are quite significant, like Clostridia, which has now overtaken MRSA as the biggest problem in hospital-acquired infections. And of course, anthrax, which we have all heard about quite often. Now, spores are intriguing uh, natural materials. If one looks at the coat of a spore, it's essentially nature's armor, perhaps the most amazing armor that has ever been found on this planet. Spores can lie dormant for thousands of years, only to reemerge within minutes into a strong pathogen. We don't understand that process very well, but what we're looking to do is take advantage of a Trojan horse approach whereby we trick the spores into thinking it's time to germinate, only to kill them upon their germination because of these enzyme-based surfaces. Now, killing bad bacteria is one thing. What about therapeutic advantages for the human? Well, there are ways we can do that. We can take advantage of proteins bound to iron oxide nanoparticles. When they get targeted to, let's say, an ion channel, the iron oxide, in the presence of a, micro, a radio frequency wave, can be heating, heated up. At the same time, what that does is cause the ion channel to open up, calcium comes in. At the end of that, it turns on the gene. In this case, it could be used, perhaps, to turn on insulin production, so it could be a very easy way to generate insulin in diabetics. So we can take a healthy or a disease cell and convert it very rapidly into a healthy one. In addition to the poison ivy that I mentioned before, Biocatalysis can actually be used in a very easy way to generate some rather simple molecules which do remarkable things. So if you take a simple sugar and modify it using an enzyme, it turns into a material that then assembles into packed materials, which then form fibers, ultimately gels. Now those gels can do some intriguing things, including soak up oil. So it can be imagined that you can have little cubes of olive oil that you can just take out of a, a drawer somewhere or uh, out of your pantry rather than liquid, or more critically, put it in the ocean to uh, soak up oil spills that might be formed from, of course, uh, that we've seen like last year with BP. If we look at any of these approaches, we need to develop things in a scalable manner. We need to develop paints and coatings that could be applied at very large scale, let's say in hospitals, on at various medical equipment, and food packaging, and so forth. We also need to develop biorefining systems where we can essentially replace the chemical refining going to biological systems to generate the materials, such as materials that could soak up oil quite effectively. What we're doing in our Center for Biotechnology and Interdisciplinary Studies is bringing together over 200 researchers that are addressing things from the basic life sciences and physical sciences through technology development and ultimately in improving the lives and benefiting society. Thank you. So I lead a center, uh, very multidisciplinary, which looks at the network science and engineering and unites many researchers from many disciplines. They are spread all over the campus, but they share students, postdocs, and also passion for network science. Our focus is on technology-based social networks in which nodes are humans and connections are relations uh, between these humans. Each individual is involved in many different networks representing various activities and uh, roles which we play in society. Even children share opinions, earn trust, and build networks of friends and partners. These interactions rely uh, on personal meetings in which verbal and body language are equally important. And in social movements, such personal meetings have the larger scales in big cities, where rallies and demonstrations can become very large, and then the social movement behind them can have power, self-confidence, and visibility. But today, technology expanded the reach of social networks. Today, they span the globe and connect continents. White links indicates connections which uh, are used to exchange opinions, sharing the news, but also just keeping in touch. 
And the number of social, net, uh, social media available today is very impressive. The most popular, Facebook, has hundreds of millions of members. They enable a totally new level of social interactions, but they also keep a, a measurable record of interactions. And uh, when the measurement starts, science quickly follow. For example, we can quantify what is the impact of distance on friendship. And as shown on this diagram, when the distance increases, the number of links to red dots representing non-friends increases too. However, the links to friends remain. It was not possible in the past when the geographical separation cut friendships very much. Social relations rely on homophily, tendency of humans to associate and bond with similar others. For example, in high school network, quickly a community splits into three different groups along the gender, age, and also background, which are very well connected inside, but very poorly connected outside. This is not desired. So to avoid such segregation, we can rely on commitment, which is the force which enables people to keep their views and beliefs despite obstacles. Commitment is typical in the sports and religious communities. Committing some students to unity brings integration in the social network. Shown as nodes with yellow halos, they quickly transform the divided network into one unified large community. The question then arises, is it always possible to do such transformation using committed students or committed agents? Well, in fact, when there are few individuals which are committed, red dots, then uh, they cannot convince the majority of green dots to their opinion. Even if they occasionally uh, convince one of the green nodes to become red, then this red quickly becomes back green thanks to the other remaining green nodes. So there is no really growth in the number of students, in the number of green uh, dots, and the diagram stays green. However, that changes thanks to the existence of the tipping point. This tipping point uh, uh, causes, when it's, when it's uh, uh, exceeded, crossed, that enables red dots to convince steadily the green dots to their opinion. And as we see in this diagram, very quickly, the whole diagram becomes red. Surprisingly, there is a small percentage needed of committed agents in the order of 7 to 10% of the whole network. It was intuitively known in social sciences. Weakness of divided uh, actions of intellectuals and workers against communism in Poland led to the integrated opposition, creating solidarity movement. As the result, committed to solidarity exceeded the tipping point, and they were able to convince the entire society. But our research can guide also public relation campaigns, helping to decide when and how to react when events bring negative attention to a company, or when the company has a new product which needs to be introduced to the society. Our result in form of the right approach how to do it. The idea is that committing minority of society to the new idea, instead of getting the idea known to everybody, is the way to go. Because it enables the committed minority to convince the others. So using the value of commitment engages the network in spreading the idea. The conclusion is that the value of traditional commitment is more important today in our technology-driven world than it was ever before. Thank you. So I'm sure that all of our speakers uh, are happy to address any questions that you might have. Um, would anyone like to ask the first question? 
Dr. Hajela. So this question is for our nanoscale technologist, Jonathan, you in particular. Um, you described a, an exciting space, which is at the intersection of the biomolecule, the, uh, the nanostructured materials, and uh, the proteins. Now, to get results at the intersection of these three uh, quantities, how well do you understand what goes on? Or is it still at the stage where you are testing and trying to see what comes out of this? Yeah, well, do, you have, do you have tools available to answer the what if questions? Well, we always look for uh, being lucky sometimes. Uh, to be honest with you, we know more and more about nanomaterials, their structures, their functions, their, their shapes, and their chemistries, and so forth. We know a good amount about polymers. We know much, much less about biomolecules. Uh, we know how to isolate them. We know how to characterize them in part. We don't know how they fold uh, and how they get their structure. So we are lagging in that domain. On the other hand, sometimes exploiting some properties can come before really understanding all the details. And in many cases, by doing that exploit exploitation, you do learn more about what's going on. So we're at a point now where we just begin to see that we could take advantage of these and use them in some applications. What we don't know is all the details that go within it, and that's left for my students and their students to ultimately uh, solve all the details, but it's exciting going along the way. Please. So the um, connection of sort of the bio to the nano was clear, but when we start looking at the networks, we see a connection needed much more to a social and social science kind of side at a engineering re uh, oriented university like yours or ours. Um, how do we see that playing out, and how do we bring more of that together to cross that famous social science? Uh, so bringing the social sciences and the technologies together. I think that our strong background in technology is really an advantage. Because as I mentioned in my talk, what really is changing the game is the fact that today we can rely on the record of interactions, which was not ever available previously. And it is also available massively. So our understanding of the social interactions is, can be much deeper. As I mentioned, when the measurement starts, the science quickly follows. So this is, this is really uh, uh, this fact. And of course, collecting this data requires the knowledge from computer science, computer engineering, and also the new devices which are being developed and the new networks which are being offered uh, with evolving, with evolving uh, internet, both on the side of the software and hardware, creates this environment in which our social interactions no longer uh, need this personal meeting, which was the basis of all the sociology in the past. And that is the game changer in which we have advantage of our universities with our strong background. So our center is really strong in this interaction between the communication and information networks with the social networks, understanding it as a two-way street, how the social demands changes the, the, the network technology and technology at all uh, the, in general, but also how technology shapes what kind of human interactions we have. And there is no doubt that it, there is this influence both sides. For example, the speed with which we have new generation of computers is not the issue of technology. It's not even the issue so much economy, but social acceptance. If our computers would double speed every two months, extremely expensive but possible, society wouldn't accept it. So therefore, Moore's law is the interaction of the social and economic and technological forces. And the understanding of that shows a very good impact of social on technology. And other ways also, our children, our grandchildren in my case, interact differently than we did as kids. We don't know how it would impact our relations and their relations and their social circles. Ours are very limited to proximity of people with whom we interact personally as, as kids. Today, it's no longer the truth. 
So I think it's a very interesting, very futuristic direction for university like ours to look at these interactions. Bullock, actually, I have a question for you. It's one that I've posed to you before. When people interact through uh, technology-enabled social networks, uh, people come from different uh, languages. They come from different uh, cultures. How do you see uh, cultural differences reflected in social networks, and how do you measure that? And do the interactions through the networks themselves influence the culture? That's a very, very deep question. And answer, surprisingly, is there are two trends which I can describe. One trend is the trend of sort of unification. As we look at the history of the human interactions in a very broad scope, that started with you know, this small tribe of gather, uh, gatherers, hunters, 150 according to the Dunbar number, which interacted with themselves, nothing more. Then we have tribes. Then we have sort of city nations like in Greece in the thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe this size, until empires, which sort of encompasses culturally similar groups of people uh, starting from Roman and so forth. So clearly we see that as technology improves the ability of governing larger and larger group of people, then we are create, creating bigger and bigger organizations in which culture is shared. It stops in Europe, for example, in these small, small countries compared to the size of, say, uh, India, US, or Canada. But in other parts of the world, we have large, large you know, countries which you can fly from here to San Francisco, except the weather. You don't notice much difference, cultural difference, still the same language. So that's one trend which would say enabling this mega, mega uh, control may lead to unification. But there's another trend which I call the trend of you know, Amazon uh, created for books. And this is a very interesting trend. Amazon changed the way books are being sold fundamentally. Normally, bookstore, now even the largest, can sell maybe 10,000, maybe 10, 20,000 titles. So if you were the author and your book was 20,000, you were lucky. It was being uh, available in large bookstores. If you were the author and your book was 20,001, you had a vast drop in sales because it was, it was a special order. The same happens with ideas. Ideas, in order to be creative and growing in life, require enough supporters around you. So then, under pressure of this homophily, you would not give up. If you are the only one person believing, I don't know, on flowers in the moon, that's a crazy idea, but something, something like that, and nobody supports you, you say maybe they don't exist. Today, if you have a crazy idea, you will find on the internet 20 other people in the world which agree with you. <laughs> so we can imagine that the number of different subcultures, number of different ideologies may grow very, very much compared to what we have today. So we have, we have these two pressures. Bigger cities bring unification. You know, bigger countries bring unification. But today, technology enables the existence of very strange you know, cultural phenomenon because people would be introverted and would use the social media in order to find people thinking like them. So that's the answer. Other questions? Please. I have a question. This is uh, harkening back to the, the social sciences, but um, I guess I'm wondering what we can learn from the social sciences in terms of methodologies that would help us inform and predict cultural impact of the things that are being measured. So this is actually drawing from Jim's questions and also back to Jeff's questions. I, I can say a lot. And, and I think that this is something which needs to be, needs to be, uh, needs to be addressed. Because uh, psychology, for example, and you know, sociology, they develop enormous experimental base in which experiments in terms of ingenuity involved in them. Because there is a big problem. When you try to measure something, and you know, for example, that your, 
you know, you have a questionnaire. The order of the questions impacts. The form of the questions impacts the answers. Because typically, and that's sort of like almost a joke, what question, question person answers is not what exactly this person believes, but what this person thinks would please the questionnaire a bit. And that influenced the results. So there are ingenious way of avoiding these different biases, which we need to carefully learn, because this methodology could be fruitfully applied to the conclusions which sometimes uh, people are rushed into from the, from the, say, engineering sciences, looking at the results of, of, of you know, measurements in the social networks. Because then, of course, we have to always remember that, for example, simple thing. Uh, coincidence, I mean, correlation is not co uh, causation. We can see things which are correlated. It doesn't mean that they influence each other. We also need to learn different interpretation. Human beings are extremely complex. So as a result, measuring human beings is extremely difficult. So I think that all this machinery developed in psychology and sociology would inform. The point is that both Groups, network scientists looking, working social networks, and sociologists, which are mainly experimental, look a bit sort of suspicious at each other. They shouldn't. They can learn from each other a lot. And I think, again, we could be a platform which would provide this, this, this basis for collaboration. You know, uh, two thoughts, uh, Mary. One is, Social scientists are used to dealing with large data sets where the data in many ways is unstructured. Uh, the way the questions are posed have a certain structure. I'm going outside of my sphere here. But it is not the typical controlled experiment that, say, a physicist might do. And so the ability then to <clears throat> uh, create the analytical capability uh, based on what may appear to be unstructured uh, phenomena, social phenomena, I think can teach us a lot as we try to understand uh, what goes on in social networks. So, so that's one. The second is that I asked the question about language because there really is a, a question about cultural nuance in how people interact with each other. And, and I experienced that when I was chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and going abroad. And frankly, I didn't um, know the languages of every uh, person in every country I visited. And many times we had translators. But actually, there was a lot in body language and gestures and so on that one learned about what was really being said, uh, even sort of beyond what was being translated. And so here the question becomes, as more and more people interact uh, through uh, these technologies, through the social networks enabled by technologies, how do we do those readings? And I don't think we know yet. And then the final thing is, I'm not sure that we totally understand the influence of social networks on the cognitive development of young people, even our own students, which is why we're interested in forming the Center for Cognition, Communication, and Culture, because in fact, that ties very strongly into the linkage between the social sciences, even the humanities, and the kind of technology-enabled interactions we're talking about. Let's see if there are other questions here. Bill. I have a question for the stealth educator. Uh, <laughs> given your experience uh, with the work that you've done, what do you see as the obstacles to translating research into, given the title of this presentation, the commercial environment? What, how should researchers be thinking about that, and what are some of the obstacles that you faced over time, and, and how you've overcome those? Oh, thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's a very hard uh, business. 
uh, getting things out of the laboratory and into the marketplace. And um, uh, the, the, the uh, well, there, there are many stages of difficulty in, in that process. Uh, the first is to um, take what is, happens in the laboratory uh, and to uh, scale it up to uh, where it's a, a commercially significant uh, processes. Uh, the other is to find uh, ready markets uh, for the products uh, that you might make, and it has to be, uh, there, are, there are sort of two sides to that coin. Uh, probably before Steve Jobs, it was always thought you had to have a market pull. Uh, I guess it's also possible to create new markets uh, if you're clever enough, uh, as, as Apple uh, did. Uh, and, uh, but you have to have uh, the ability to um, get a product across what's this, this called the valley of death in, in the uh, technology transfer area. And it's also um, uh, an issue of actually translating what you do in the laboratory or in the early development stages uh, to the manufacturing processes. And that's, uh, that can be very difficult. And, uh, and just fitting into uh, the manufacturing realm um, uh, of, of existing uh, industry uh, is difficult. So there, there are a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, it's very easy to sit on the te technical end of things and sort of say, you know, have a wonderful discovery and something that uh, is potentially very useful and think that you've done uh, almost all the work that needs to be done. Uh, in fact, you've probably done a few percent of, of what needs to be done and there's a huge amount of work. Uh, certainly my own experience over the last uh, uh, 23 years since I founded uh, a company uh, is, uh, is a good example uh, of, the, uh, of the, the work that's required. Uh, but it's, uh, on the other hand, very, very rewarding uh, to, to see uh, what you've done in the laboratory uh, at a sort of microscopic scale, or in our case now, nanoscopic scale, uh, to move on to uh, benefiting society. Uh, and uh, it's really a necessity because uh, eventually all of our research is basically funded uh, by taxpayer dollars. And if society does not benefit uh, from that investment, and it is an investment, it's not just a gift, uh, an investment in that research, then the uh, whole research uh, endeavor uh, goes away. And so it's an it's a important question you've asked, and uh, I hope you know, some, some uh, insight has been uh, given. Other questions? Well, actually, I have a question for each of the three of the main speakers here. Each one of you uh, leads a center that is inherently interdisciplinary. Uh, we all exist within the university framework where typically uh, people come from a given discipline or a given department. But you've brought people together in very successful ways to do very creative and innovative things. So how have you done that? John and then Dick and Bolick, whoever. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the bottom line is uh, that ev everyone in a center realizes that they can do much more by collaborating with other people because problems in society today are so complicated that we can't just look at an individual solving it or an individual discipline solving the problem. Uh, and in fact, it's almost impossible to get the funding to do that these days because of that. So, you know, from the research side, I think it's very easy. From the pedagog pedagogical side, it's been more difficult because everybody belongs to a department, and we tend to look at that in a very provincial way, that we're department of this, department of that. Uh, and so I think in uh, the hallmark of a major research university is to have people be comfortable at both the multidisciplinary work at a center for their research, to exist in an academic home, for the students to feel the same thing, but uh, be able to be comfortable in going well outside of their discipline and not being concerned about what others might think. And, and I think that that's a, a big step that 
you know, we've taken here at Rensselaer. Uh, many institutions have not taken that yet, and they're well behind. But it's still a challenge, and, you know, we need to foster more of that. So it's great to be in a department, but it's even better to be in a department and in a multidisciplinary organization that will look for that diversity to solve important problems. So I think the uh, critical issue is, uh, and really the nucleating issue, is to, to, to surround yourself with really good people uh, that have the confidence to work with other good people and to uh, respect, build a, 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 a network, coming back to Bolex, uh, a, a network uh, of, self, of respect uh, for uh, expertise in other areas. Uh, and then uh, couple that with an eagerness uh, to really learn. Because one of the things that, and I think you know, John and I work, work very closely together, and have for a number of years. Uh, um, it, it's a tremendous learning experience to work with an, an expert in a complementary field uh, to yours uh, that you can build upon each other's strengths to do things that neither of you could really do uh, at that level uh, by yourselves and to, uh, to uh, take on wonderful students, some of them in the audience, uh, that have that uh, excitement about learning in d different fields. Uh, some come in with that. Uh, others get it when they come here. Uh, but it's just that uh, milieu of uh, excitement and interest and eagerness to learn and a mutual respect of, of working together and a self-confidence and, uh, and, and a, at least a modest suppression of ego uh, that's necessary. We all have strong egos, so it's not, you don't want to suppress it too much. Uh, but but uh, th that you can accept uh, your colleagues and uh, agree to disagree uh, a lot about issues, uh, but uh, having the very uh, serious goal of, uh, of expanding human knowledge in the area that you're working uh, and to uh, hopefully serve society. And I think that's really uh, the, the key to developing any of these uh, centers that have uh, been, been successful. It is very interesting that what you were talking about, uh, Dick, really is also the answer to the question which our president posed, how we can get understanding of different cultures and different languages. Because really this is the basis, the respect, the trying to understand, you know, even if at the first moment something seems to us unusual or crazy or different method, like for example, social sciences using different, different sources and different methods, it's very well defined, believe me. These societies use different language, these communities of different researchers in different disciplines, they had the reason why they developed that way. And once you have this respect, then you learn a lot. So that's the basis of the approach, which I think is, is so important. The other, which also motivates very much my colleagues in computer science and, and, and also, you know, uh, in Rensselaer, is the fact of realizing that it's much better to lead instead of chase. So if you are looking at, for example, development of computer science in traditional areas, there are so many strong universities that we would have a long chase to get to be the leader. But in the new areas, like, such as social networks based on technology, uh, web science and others, we could be the leaders and others would chase us. And that's a very comfortable position as long as we have respect our colleagues with whom we work and try to understand them and also remember the very, very simple thing. We are all human beings with different talents and something which is easy for us may be difficult for others and something which is difficult for us may be easy for, for, for others. So therefore the collaboration helps if you work with people who have talents different from you, knowledge different from you, expertise different from you, because that leads to very long, strong collaborations. That's my experience. So there's another interesting parallel that comes back to the question that was asked. Uh, and I, uh, my students will uh, you know, have heard this before. Uh, to speaking to somebody in another discipline uh, is, uh, is really like learning a foreign language. Uh, we all swear that we don't uh, speak in any jargon, uh, but we all speak in jargon uh, in our various little pockets of science. 
And uh, it's a, when you're speaking to somebody in even a closely related field, but a different one than yours, uh, I liken it to being you know, dropped by plane into the middle of Azerbaijan uh, with no language uh, knowledge at all, and then you have to survive. And so there's, a, there's this real uh, learning, um, uh, cultural learning uh, experience at, at first of you know, just the language itself, the words, uh, but it's also the, the whole thinking process. Uh, I, was, I was brought up as a physicist uh, initially. Uh, John was brought up as a chemical engineer initially, I guess. Uh, and uh, you know, people just ask different sort of questions uh, and ask them in different ways. And there's this, always this uh, initial period where you look at somebody who's just asked you a question and you sort of look at them and say, I wonder why he asked that question. It's not, a, it's not a question I would have asked. And there's, there's this, this whole uh, development of a, of a social network uh, at a very much uh, local scale uh, that uh, goes to uh, building up uh, those relationships that, in fact, uh, eventually bear real fruit. Actually, another kind of interdisciplinarity that we're actually trying to understand is how you marry the virtual, the digital, with human scale. Uh, what's unique about bringing all of you together in one place from an educational and research point of view as opposed to having you dispersed and just interacting through uh, social media. But you're going to help us, I hope, the students here, uh, think about and answer all these questions. I think these gentlemen have summarize things very well. I want to thank you for coming out and uh, ask that you join us. We have a, a little reception outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.